All right, welcome back everyone. That was a pretty interesting morning of diversity and uh, justice, and maybe we can carry on that theme for our ocean wildlife. Um, we're very excited, we've got a great panel. Um, and I guess I should, maybe I should reintroduce myself. I'm Laura McKay with the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. And I'm um, just so happy to be here with you all in person. But we have a great panel set up for you, and we're a little nervous. It's a lot of information, and we're going to try to speak quickly and, and get through it. Um, we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, but anyway, we, um, ocean conservation is obviously a huge topic. And so for this year's forum, we tried to narrow it down a little bit to wildlife. And so we're going to be focusing on wildlife. If only they could talk to us and tell us what they need and what their filters are and <laughs> how we can relate to them better, um, that would be wonderful. But alas, um, we, we can't. And so we do the best we can with the tools that we have. And so um, we're going to um, today go over some of the new approaches to thinking about wildlife conservation and, um, and then tell you something about the tools we do have and the data that we have and what some of our needs are and also the conservation measures that we have and where the gaps are and what we may need to do a better job. So um, <clears throat> with that, I also wanted to mention that another big aspect of ocean conservation is the marine debris issue. And we also, Mako Marco has a uh, marine debris work group. And I think Avalon mentioned this morning that we are working very hard in that work group on plastics in the ocean. And so we are having a summit in Ocean City, December 5 through 7, and we hope you all will join us for that. So with that, I think we'll just jump right into it and get started. And our first speaker is um, virtual, and he is Dr. Pat Halpin. And hopefully we can bring up his happy face this morning. Uh, Dr. Halpin is a professor of marine geospatial ecology in the Marine Science <clears throat> and Conservation Division at the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University, and he leads the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab and is the co-PI of the uh, DOE Boehm Wildlife <coughs> excuse me, and Offshore Wind Project for the U.S. Atlantic Coast. So Pat, we're so glad, so glad to have you this morning. Do we see him there? Is his camera on? Oh, there. Okay. There you are. All right. Yes. Good morning, Pat. Thank you so much for being with us. I wish I could be there in person. <laughs> we wish so too. All right. Um, so I guess I can take it away here. As Laura mentioned, I'm going to be giving an initial overview of ocean wildlife conservation issues and emerging responses. I'm going to be talking mainly in the future tense. And the rest of the speakers after me are going to talk a lot more in the present tense about you know what are the current data issues, what are the current data that are in the portals and things like that. But I want to give a little overview as kind of a teaser of where things are heading, different directions, different things that are happening. So first off, um, my lab has been working in the Mid-Atlantic region for decades. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of work um, with the marine life data analysis team. Um, provisioning data and models and synthesis products for the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast data portals and ocean planning processes. Also, as Laura mentioned, I'm the co-PI of a new emerging project on specifically on wildlife and offshore wind funded by DOE and BOEM. And there we're interacting with the regional data portals, but also with the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, RWSC, and really trying to look at how do we look at these changes in ocean development and potential impacts on wildlife. So we have a lot to cover here. So I'm going to go through at a very high level, really, like I said, as a teaser to talk about some emerging new issues and things on the horizon, and then also some directions and new data products and kind of methods that are coming down the queue. And um, so I'm going to jump right into them. So first to talk about changes in the blue economy, the need and direction for cumulative impact assessments, um, climate change, which is a big issue we we're trying to contend with these days, and then some new policy goals of net gain and net positive impacts and thinking about that from the lens of what are the data and analysis tools that you need to answer these kinds of questions. 
So just to set the context, um, development in the ocean is happening and it's going to increase. And so really from the science perspective, we like to think of this as an issue where we need to decouple the linkage between increased ocean uses and increased habitat degradation and wildlife disturbances. And so the idea here is that blue line in the graph you're seeing in this paper is showing the trend over time, where as we increase ocean uses, we tend to increase ocean degradation. And what we'd like to do is get to that green line where we are increasing our ocean uses, but we're doing it with much, much less harm. So really flattening that curve is what we really want to do. So ocean planning, marine spatial planning is one of the tools that we try to use to look at trying to um, conduct ocean uses um, for many different sectors um, in the context of marine habitats and wildlife. And there's a big need, and this is nothing new, to move from single sector approaches where you're looking just at fisheries or just at offshore energy or just at shipping and really looking at multi-sector planning but the big thing that's being pushed in the academic realm these days is trying to think more about how would you actually look at cumulative impacts so not just stacking these things up, but looking at the potential interactions. So one of the things that's on the horizon now that we're trying to contend with is thinking about moving from taking data where we're taking lots and lots of data layers of the ocean, putting it into data portals, which is a wonderful thing to do, but then how do we actually take that and really tease apart the potential positive and negative impacts and how they're dispersed across lots of pressures and lots of ecosystem components. And this gets to be pretty complicated. So this is something that the academic community is struggling with, and we really need to see how this is going to impact users and governance issues. So the US is moving in these directions on cumulative impacts. This is just one example from a, a BOEM report from the South Atlantic Continental Shelf. But the idea here is we're starting to look at mainly um, looking at arrays or tables of um, impact producing factors and how they relate. So this particular table is looking at impacts related to marine mammals and looking at all the different kinds of impacts that might relate together and, and have cumulative types of effects. This is a great first step, but in the future, we're gonna need to do a much more detailed job of quantifying these kinds of impacts. And this is where the challenge is gonna lie. There are some examples emerging. So um, in the Baltic and North Sea, Sweden has some examples of trying to do cumulative impact studies in their ocean planning. And this is just showing some snapshots here of trying to tease out these effects. And so these are fairly complex models. And so I wanted to show this just to kind of preview things that are kind of coming to theater soon could be fairly complex models of how do we actually look at these kinds of interactions and interactive effects. Um, in addition, um, I have colleagues in Australia we're working closely with that are looking at cumulative impacts um, and using what's called a directive graph modeling approach. And here, this is an example here for looking at the Great Barrier Reef. And the idea is trying to build models that let you look at different kinds of human uses, activities, many different um, ecosystem functions, and then looking at changing climate altogether. And as I said, some of these are gonna be fairly complex models and we really need to think about not just how do we do the academic every tower modeling, but how do we actually translate that into things that are actionable um, in terms of regional planning. Probably the biggest cumulative impact is climate change. And we could do an entire session, an entire talk just on this one topic for sure. Um, climate change is changing the playing field that we're playing on. And so it is really moving things and making it more difficult for us to be able to model and to develop the inferences we want to be able to impact our management planning. Two things that we really need to do a better job on on climate change in the ocean realm is better jobs on anticipating the climatic impacts on ecosystems and species distributions really how do we actually do a better job of anticipating what these changes are gonna be. And then we really need to clearly discern what's the climate signal versus other kinds of signals because we're going to have many 
opportunities where we're going to need to be able to tease out the baseline from some sort of impact. So you have offshore energy development, you have fisheries, you have shipping, you have all these other pressures on the ocean, and we need to be able to discern what's the change in the species distribution, the wildlife changes that can be attributed to those uses versus what's the changes that could be attributed or should be attributed to climatic change. The last of these issues that is kind of on the horizon is one that's much more of a new objective. And I sit on the um, U United Kingdom's offshore energy program on their advisory panel. And there's a program called EcoWind. And in the UK, they've already adopted a, a new policy of net gain, which is that um, approaches for development in the natural environment has to be left measurably better state than beforehand. And this is something that is just starting to get you know, talked about, I think, on this side of the Atlantic. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a marine law symposium two weeks ago in Rhode Island looking exactly on this topic. And I'm thinking about this in the lens of someone who needs to provide data, baselines, future analysis, and what kind of information and what kind of inferences would you have to have if you wanted to actually measure net gain in an ecosystem that the effect is actually a positive effect or a negative effect or a neutral effect. And so this is something that um, we really are going to need to think very clearly about and how are we going to put together the data and the synthesis and the models to actually conduct this. The second suite of topics I want to go through are really new emerging techniques. And so um, space-time models and persistence analysis, joint models, transboundary models, and near real-time monitoring and forecasting, or what we sometimes call now casting. So usually spend a lot of time looking at maps to look at the spatial distributions. But these days, we're spending a lot more time looking at the temporal overlap. So questions of looking at wind energy areas and asking questions about how long are these seabirds going to be persistent in this area? How, how and when are marine mammals going to be passing through these sites? So I think we're fo our focus is kind of shifting quite a bit to thinking much more about time. And we're also thinking about space, but thinking about time quite a bit more. So just to show you some examples here, this is an example um, the moving image on the right-hand side are a 12 month uh, monthly time step model of North Atlantic right whales in this recent model that we've developed. Jason Roberts in my lab is the lead modeler for this. And you're seeing the patterns changing through time. And we have overlaid here two examples of wind energy areas, vineyard wind and empire wind. And what we're really interested in is trying to look at the time course. When would we expect animals to be on site? When would we expect them not to be on site? And what's the persistence in those time periods? Just to zoom into this a little more, this is just pulling out vineyard wind and looking at multiple species. What I've highlighted in those boxes are fin whales, humpback whales, minke whales, and North Atlantic right whale. The orange traces are the expectation of the abundance and density of animals through 12 months of the year for each of those. And then the dashed lines are comparisons to different regions. And so one of the questions we find is not just when do you expect animals to be on a site, but how much of the population is that? You have a reference, you know, a ruler you can use to say, is that a big amount? Is that a small amount? And so we're struggling right now with how do we develop this kind of information for use in wildlife planning, but also in our research of wildlife interactions with wind energy. So in addition to thinking about time and persistence, another big technical trend that's on the horizon are what we call joint models. In the past, we've been modeling species one species at a time, and we're continuing to do that. But there's now a new movement to trying to model multiple species together. This is an example from a very recent paper from one of my past PhD students, Sarah Roberts. And this is looking at taking trawl survey data for fish species in the mid-Atlantic region and modeling 30 species at a time instead of one species at a time and looking at changes in whole clusters of species and how they shift through time in the trawl survey data sets. Why do we do this? Well, this kind of modeling allows us to really look better at the significance of environmental variables and really start to look at species dependencies. How are species actually interacting together instead of modeling them each separately? 
It also has a potential benefit in that if we're looking at climate change and forecasting, there may be rare species that are associated with more common species, and we may be able to make inferences that if the common species are shifting, that the rare species might be shifting with them. That first example I just showed was looking at joint models of all fish taxa. We currently have um, work in the queue right now. Actually, Sarah has a second paper that's in final review, looking at interactions between predator and prey. So looking at marine mammals and fish species, for example. So there's a lot of really interesting work to be done currently with joint models. We're not the only ones working on this. And so I just wanted to have a shout out here for the NERA project direction on the steering committee for that, the Northeast Regional Marine Fish Habitat Assessment. And the group at Monmouth University, Chris Hack, is leading a community level basis function modeling approach, which is another version of a joint modeling approach. So these things are emerging and you're gonna probably see a lot of joint models in the next five years. A third new area of interest that I wanted to highlight is trying to change the extent of the areas we're focusing on. And North Atlantic right whale is a very, very important and critical species. And one of the issues that's been occurring over the last several years is its range has been shifting, we believe, due to climatic changes. And the animals are spending a significantly long, longer period in of time in Canadian waters north of the mid-Atlantic region. And it's making it hard for us to actually conduct scientific analysis and think about proper management responses if literally the, the whales are off our map for half the year. And so we started a process that's just getting underway between NOAA and DFO Canada to start looking at explore, exploratory work on a transboundary species distribution model. And I think this will be very interesting and very relevant work um, coming to theater soon, as I said, in, into the future. So thinking about modeling, not just in US waters, but thinking about modeling across into other, other jurisdictions and then back again. And then the last one I just want to bring up is thinking about um, timing, but here thinking about models of wildlife where we're trying to go from models that might be seasonal or monthly kinds of models down to things that are much more what we think of as now casting. How do we push the envelope in terms of building our ability to forecast it, species um, in much, much shorter time frames. So we're starting to work in this realm of assimilating work to try to uh, push the limits as we can on developing new um, now casting kinds of approaches. So this is something we're just getting off the ground with partners at NOAA to see if we can do a better job of increasing our time step and being able to look more closely instead of having kind of the almanac, having something that's more of a forecast. So I wanted to very quickly go through some topics to kind of teasers, like I said, to have you guys thinking about new, new issues. The real lens we're looking at in this, this panel is really thinking about what are the data needs, what are the approaches, um, what are the things we actually practically have to do. So I wanted to use this just as a way to get you thinking about what's coming down the pipe in the next three to five years. So you have an idea of what kind of data we're gonna to need to be thinking about, what kinds of new analysis are we gonna to need to have? Thank you. That's a lot to think about, and um, rest assured, the slides will be available <laughs> after this. Um, and um, I wanted to mention real quickly before we go to our next speaker um, that when we're at the end of this session, we're going to have some Mentimeter questions. And if this works right, if I just hit the forward button now, um, no, that will go to Jay's. So there we go, oops, there we go. Um, these are the questions, and so we wanted you to be thinking about them. Um, what are the gaps in our wildlife data that keep you up at night? What additional information on the portal is gonna help us identify our wildlife conservation priorities? And most especially, um, MAKO does have an ocean conservation work group and I wanna recognize Kevin Hassel, who has been um, co-leading this new work group with me. And um, when I retire, he's gonna take over and we'd love to have a federal co-lead for that work group. So if anyone's interested, um, please let Kevin know. Um, I don't wanna leave him alone. <laughs> but um, anyway, the important thing is, what should, what should this MAKO work group do 
to advance ocean wildlife conservation over the next five years. So please be thinking about that as you hear the next presentations. And with that, we will go into Jay's, and I should be able to forward to you now, Jay. And um, as he's coming up here, I'll just say Jay is a wonderful friend and colleague, and actually um, he was my first grantee to actually start creating the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal when he was with the Nature Conservancy. And we're just so proud of how far it's come since uh, 2009 we started working on it, and 2010 launched it, and it's just an amazing thing now. But um, Jay is our, um, he's a fisheries and ocean conservation fellow at Monmouth University's Urban Coast Institute, marine science and policy expert with over 30 years of experience working to advance sustainable fisheries and ocean health. So thank you, Jay. <clears throat> thank you, Laura. Um, you said a bunch of what I was about to say. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, very exciting for me um, to see what has happened um, with the portal's development since I kind of walked away from it for close to uh, almost 10 years. And um, what has, what, what's been built only happened because of this continuity of purpose that, that Marco principals and the Mar fabulous Marco staff had, and particularly um, with the leadership from Monmouth and, and, and Carl, Carl Labillacoba's leadership pushing this whole thing forward. It's been just been phenomenal. Um, as has been mentioned, the, the mid, you know, so a little bit about what makes the Mid-Atlantic special. It is, we've got one of the heaviest human footprints in the whole planet here in our, if you want to say, urban, urban ocean. It's, uh, and, you know, and underneath these colored lines and little dots that describe the global shipping lanes and, and where the food that people bring from the ocean to us come from. Underneath that are, are people with a lot that many of you know with a lot of stories. And one of the things that the portal does, and, and Carl has done a great job of, is really bringing out some of those stories that are underneath the data. So we remember when we were looking at the little colored maps that there's people and, and whales and such like underneath them. Um, you know, we're doing this because people want different things from the same patch of ocean. Uh, and, and this patch is really special. It's, uh, you know, one of the things that makes it unique is being a migratory crossroads, you know, for this annual north-south migration of many critters from right whales to various birds and striped bass uh, to these cross-shelf migrants like black sea bass is the warp and weft of a pretty amazing tapestry of biodiversity that we have that is still amazingly resilient, alive and kicking despite that, that human pressure. Um, so we got, we got to stay busy, but um, the portal, we hope, is a, is a really good tool that helps to inform better decision making. Um, so Pat asked uh, you know, us to think you know, into the future with that world-class modeling team is really leading us to really get better at capturing the dynamics of the ocean and, and including the ecology, and it's really exciting. My five-minute tour is, is you know, showing you what is current, the current holdings are, just a little bit of an orientation so that you can find it. These slides will be available. So the data on the portal is organized in these, in these, 13, three, in these 13 themes. Um, I'll focus on the ones that really specifically show the distribution and abundance of marine wildlife, um, but as has been mentioned by Laura and others, you know, there's many relevant, um, you know, many relevant um, data layers in the portal, depending on your wildlife conservation questions and, 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 and so on, you know, the locations of balloon cleanup or, or beach cleanup areas um, and, and so on. Um, so, but. Two, two areas, marine life and marine life library. One has summary products that would include things like, um, you know, groups of cetaceans, all, all cetaceans that are sensitive to certain sound frequencies, for example, um, all um, various birds that feed in a certain way that influences, you know, plunge divers that influences their risks around wind power, and 30 other examples uh, or so. In the marine life library, you get very specific species-specific information. The, the marine life theme has a lot of different choices. I'm not going to read through these. This is the first page of two that wouldn't fit on the screen, but you can see the major taxa that are in there, the birds and the fish species, which we are counting as marine wildlife, too, and you'll hear more about that from Jessica Coakley shortly. Um, 
in the marine mammal uh, selection here, which is sort of selected at the top of the right screen there, you will click that and you will see those summary products I mentioned. In the marine library, I'll call your attention to this search function. Any of the portal entries that you see the little, um, the little triangles indicating there's a drop down menu, they have these search functions. They're very powerful. I just typed in HU and the 12 months of humpback whale distribution data came up. Um, and you know, Pat did a nice job of explaining why it's not that useful always just to have an annualized version of where stuff is. We need to know when and where. And um, there, you might wonder how there could possibly be over 6,000 layers. So for, for most of these taxa, there's like three or four different types of products that really allow a user to dig in to understand you know, the, the, uh, the coefficients of variance and things like that. So uh, you can see how the factorials um, with so many species and different kinds of products um, lead to a, a very large um, library of, that can be queried through this function. So what's coming up next? Um, you'll hear uh, we, had, we had major updates just last week and invite you to visit with Carl and others in the portal demo area during breaks. Um, but basically the resolution for marine mammals has been doubled, the finer scale down to five kilometer scale cells. And if you've worked with the data before, you're gonna love um, the, the sort of enhanced resolution and, and the, the, the types of answers you can get out of the data are, are, are improving steadily. Um, there was major updates to the turtles and birds and other, other areas of the marine wildlife um, holdings as well. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention that as part of the, the conversations in the MAKO Conservation Working Group, we're now just starting to begin to design a new conservation theme for the portal, which will be a way to organize and efficiently, you know, characterize um, area-based measures that um, relate to um, ocean conservation for habitat and, and various species. So we're excited about doing this. It will allow us to pull things that are a little bit scattered in the portal's holdings into one place and relevant in terms of um, some really highly um, aligned, you know, some, some very rel some, some, some timely products that will be great to integrate and to talk about how we integrate them, including the work that Jessica Coakley will be sharing and the work that NOAA is doing on the um, America the Beautiful Atlas. Finally, I kind of end with a group shot here of the portal team um, led by Carl uh, and Ryan just like making the, 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 <laughs> making the software work fast and, and well. It's amazing. The world-class modeling team at Duke, oh my gosh, they're, they're, they're just the best, you know. <laughs> and then John and Jim who aren't here for years have just been managing the data out of Rutgers, um, the Center for Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis. They're just amazing. Um, it, you know, when you're taking a picture, it's hard to get everyone in the shot, and some people were submerged. Jeff Herter um, uh, really helps us to make sure that our thinking is aligned with what the state's needs are. And Laura McKay, oh my gosh, I couldn't say enough. Um, <laughs> Avalon and Nick, they're, they're, under, they're, they're, they're like um, making it all possible, keeping the lights on, and giving us, you know, the benefit of their, their professional experience on, and, and, and keeping us on track. So that's all from me, and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jay. It's, um, and thank you, Tony, for bringing Jay back into the fold with us. We, we missed you, Jay, all those years. So it's, it's wonderful that you're back on the team. So next, um, we're going to have Dr. Emily Shimchenia virtually. And um, it looks like she's there. That's great. So hi, Emily. We're sorry you couldn't be with us in person, but we're so glad to have you here. Um, Emily is director of the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative for Offshore Wind. Um, for both Marco and NROC, and she's supported by Avalon Bristow with Marco, too, as an a, a assistant director, I forget what the title is, Avalon, but um, great to have you both working on this really important stuff. Um, Emily was previously a senior scientist at the Virginia, I mean at, um, sorry, I'm reading the wrong lane, um, the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative supports research and monitoring on wildlife and offshore wind by developing an integrated science plan aligning funding to meet priorities and ensuring appropriate data and standards are in place. So thanks so much for being with us this morning, Emily, and it is all yours. Hi, everyone, thank you. Um, so sorry, can't be there in person, but 
this is my one chance to appear taller than I am maybe and float above the podium. So thanks for that opportunity. Um, starting off with an introductory slide and a title slide here about RWSE or the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative for Offshore Wind. But I'm gonna you know, immediately transition into talking about all the great work that Pat and Jay mentioned that are also under the RWSE umbrella. So in addition to my role as director of RWSE, I also lead the portal team in the Northeast, the uh, working for the Northeast Regional Ocean Council, um, which I'm sure you've heard um, several times over the past couple of days is Marco's counterpart in the Northeast. Um, so I lead the portal team and, and generally um, direct their science program as well. Um, and RWSE is, is this great partnership between NROC, Marco, and many, many others that I'll describe now um, to you know, coordinate this initiative, uh, data collection um, and research related to offshore wind and wildlife. So let's see if I can advance my slides. So what, what Pat and Jay described um, really is this uh, data life cycle, right? So um, what we have been involved with for the past decade um, and as, as I've led the marine life data analysis team work over that time, we've really been focusing on half of this cycle, which is developing and disseminating data products, informing data use and decision making, um, and understanding where the gaps and needs are. Now with RWSC, um, especially with respect to offshore wind, and in some cases with cumulative impacts in general for wildlife and environment data, we're really starting to tackle the other half of this data life cycle too. So identifying data gaps and research needs, standardizing the data collection methods so that we have comparable information um, and coordinating the data collection and monitoring so that we're not duplicating efforts, we're spending resources efficiently and we're churning all of that information into the development and dissemination of data products. So. RWSC, NROC, Marco, and the data portals under NROC and Marco each have roles here um, that I think are really great and we're starting to coalesce um, it, this, entire, this entire life cycle of data and, and research needs. To zoom back out um, to some of the data sets that Jay and Pat both discussed, you know, this is what the, the marine life landscape within the portals has looked like for the past 10 years um, and it's stages, right? So the portals are coordinating that data access and expert review. There are many individual teams working on the modeling and mapping for each of these taxa. And then of course, there's even many more partners involved in making sure that the data are stored properly and available for uses other than modeling and that the data are being collected in the first place and that those programs can persist and continue to update observations that we then churn into new models and new data products that are responsive to our current needs as, as part of that cycle. So um, where does RWSE fit into all of this? So many of those logos on the previous slide are partners within RWSE and have asked for RWSE to form and, and support their work with respect to wildlife and offshore wind. So um, RWSE was cooperatively established by the federal agencies, Atlantic Coast states, Atlantic Coast offshore wind developers and many national scale and local ENGOs. Um, as you all know, there are 27, I think, active leases on the Atlantic coast right now. Um, the federal agencies and states are both requiring data collection and monitoring and doing voluntary data collection and mon monitoring of their own. The offshore wind companies are funding data collection um, and, and many other partners are funding data collection and ENGOs are participating in this process. So they asked to form RWSC to help coordinate all of that. How can we ensure that that life cycle for data and, and use is efficient? And we're really leveraging the parts that are already in place to support data and mapping and modeling and interpretation. So they came to NROC and Marco for this um, because we do um, a lot of these functions already really well and we have for many years. So things like coordinating and reviewing data together, um, engaging multiple stakeholders, identifying what the priorities are from the data, using data to drive research needs, um, managing funds and fundraising for efforts like this. And of course, facilitating access to the data, which is a huge, huge part of, of both NROC, Marco, the data portals, and RWSE. Um, we have tools that folks are familiar with, 
the, the regional data portals, and we have partners um, that have similar tools in the regional IUS associations, for example, that are, you know, longstanding and well-established partnerships where we can leverage each other's resources and tools. Um, I should also mention as part of RWSC, because our focus is the whole Atlantic coast, we've begun um, engaging and inviting Socorro, which is the Southeast counterpart to Niracus and Maracus, which are the ocean observing systems to ensure we have uh, representation from the full coast of, of data collection, management and, and dissemination. Um, I just wanted to show you the RWSC steering committee membership. Um, it's meant to rotate so that multiple entities get get their turn to um, help guide the strategic direction of the organization. But you see some mid-Atlantic um, states on here and many other um, folks that I'm sure are in the room there and as you know, longstanding partners with, with Marco um, and of course, NROC as well. The steering committee has asked us over the past two years to focus our work on two main fronts. Um, the first being developing, as Laura mentioned, an integrated science plan for wildlife habitat and offshore wind energy. Um, which I'll describe a little bit more in a minute. And the second prong of our work is coordinating that research and that funding to meet those needs. So over the last half of this year, we'll be building that capacity um, and planning to start accepting funds from uh, multiple sectors to implement the recommendations of the science plan. So that science plan, again, relates to that data life cycle um, we'll be looking to build on existing research priorities, understand what the new ones are with respect to offshore wind and the challenges it presents, as Pat described, um, understand what's already being collected out there, what modeled products exist, where their weaknesses are, how we can improve on them with additional data collection. So identifying those gaps and needs for improving the decision making. Um, and of course, standardizing the data collection facilitating sharing, providing access, ensuring that the data are managed, um, and again, aligning funding from multiple partners towards all of these common goals. A huge part of this work is being accomplished by expert subcommittees. Um, I wanna emphasize that many of these individuals that participate in RWSE subcommittees, and we have six of them, um, many of these individuals have been with us for the last decade, uh, reviewing and providing input and helping build those marine life data products that we've just learned about. Um, so it's a really nice evolution um, of the existing NROC Marco marine life work groups to pull them in to these subcommittees and continue the review of those modeled products um, and other spatial data sets on the portals through this um, effort, this new effort and this new lens um, on offshore wind and wildlife. You can go to our website to view all of the subcommittees meeting materials. Um, they're both or all, all six of them are working on chapters for the draft science plan now, some of which are posted on our website and in our public SharePoint folder. Um, we have a marine mammal, a sea turtle, birds and bats, habitat and ecosystem, technology, and protected fish species subcommittee. So there's something for everyone there. Um, and the science plan will be released at the end of June in draft form. And we'll also put on our website um, ways that folks can read it, comment on it, um, and provide input. I also want to plug that on June 22nd, we'll be holding a public webinar to introduce the science plan in ways that, that folks can read it and understand it and, and how it'll be used. The link um, to register for that is on our website as well. So kind of reflecting on what's going to be in the science plan and um, what are folks talking about in the subcommittees? What are the needs and what's the next generation of data look like for marine life? Um, we're hearing a lot about the need to integrate observations from multiple types of survey methods. So visual observations versus using new technologies, things like passive acoustics and high definition aerial imagery. I think in the next several years, all these things will come together in a more synthetic way and create more robust data products that leverage, um, you know, we're, we're not collecting data at night, for example, because humans don't see very well at night but some of these technologies allow us to do things like that. And so we'll be able to fill enormous gaps in our understanding of wildlife movement, movements just by using new technologies. Um, lots of need for real time or near real time observations, um, as well as the climatological visualizations, which are the things that summarize um, wildlife and environmental characteristics over long periods of time. So a huge range in temporal scales needed to support our modern decision-making. 
Um, and with that, nested spatial scales will be really important as well as we zoom in all the way down to the, to the scale of an individual turbine in some cases to understand what's going on. But also we wanna have this regional Atlantic coastwide understanding of how offshore wind development, along with all the other ocean uses out there, um, may be uh, affecting our environment and the wildlife in it. Um, and finally, um, data products that provide the context for targeted studies, studies that ask very discrete questions about, is this factor having an impact? Does this um, you know, offshore wind farm cause animals to aggregate around it? Um, so those contextual factors, a lot of the layers on the data portal that describe processes, oceanographic processes, and things that reflect climate change or other human activities will be really, really important to integrate uh, into everything we do um, starting now and, and going on uh, forward in the future. So just to um, re-emphasize if it wasn't clear already, I think the upshot of some of the questions that you all have to answer and that Pat posed, um, you know, collaboration is one of the key tools we have to advance biodiversity conservation and smart spatial planning and, and all of those things. And this slide reflects um, you know, it's, it's a group of collaborators uh, for each of these logos. And we know that there are many, many entities nested within each of these logos that help us implement the work that we do. Um, so we're really anxious to continue leading this work with you all. Um, Avalon and Nick are very supportive of, of the RWSE work as well and key um, links to both NROC and Marco um, and the data portal teams as well, who we've interacted with for, for many, many years will absolutely ensure that um, the science plan uh, with respect to offshore wind and the data products that RWSE relies on for sound decision making will be available um, to all for all to participate in. And so um, with that, I'll, I'll close there and thank you for your time today and, and thanks for having me virtually. I appreciate all you're doing, Emily, to round up all of that data and uh, keep it current and that integrated science plan at the end of June will be much anticipated. So thank you for all your hard work. And next we're gonna have Sue Barco, um, another friend and colleague of mine um, for a long time. And um, she's currently a contractor for the um, RWSC and also the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. Um, she was previously a senior scientist at the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center's Marine Mammal Sea Turtle Stranding Program. And she's currently working on some passive, passive acoustic monitoring of whales and developing our Virginia Marine Mammal and Sea Turtle Conservation Plan that we will be integrating into our Virginia Ocean Plan. So thank you so much for coming all the way up here from Virginia, Sue, and um, I'll let you take it over. Thank you, Laura, and thanks to everyone. Um, particularly the speakers that, that started this, this session. And, and uh, I think looking at Pat's um, and, and Emily's both presentations, it's, it's great to see where we can go with, with all of the data that have been collected. But we also have to think about the present. And in some cases, we don't have a lot of data for, for species groups. And I've been working a lot with RWSC on the sea turtle chapter of the science plan, and sea turtles are, are one area where there are some real data gaps. Um, so if you look on the Marco portal and you, and you look up sea turtle density, you get a couple of maps. There are three species represented of the four that occur very commonly in our region. And the resolution of these is not great. The data are significantly more than 10 years old. Um, there certainly are plans to update the data. There are some new density models that, that are coming out. But um, because so much time and energy is focused on marine mammals, particularly the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale, which it should be, I totally agree with it, sea turtles many times take a back seat. And so survey protocols that are designed to collect a variety uh, and information on a variety of wildlife don't necessarily collect information on a very huge proportion of the sea turtle population that's out there. Most of the AMAPS sea turtle protocols are not collecting data on small turtles that are less than 40 centimeters in carapace length, straight carapace length. If you look at our stranding data, you see that the majority of the Kemp's Ridley and, sea, and, and green sea turtles that strand in the mid-Atlantic are less than 40 centimeters straight carapace length. So we do not have a lot of data. So what do we do? Um, and so I'm here to, to put a little bit of a push into some tried and true uh, data, data 
types, and these are long-term data sets. And for sea turtles, we have stranding data. There are some sighting data, not as much in the mid-Atlantic as there are in the Northeast, but there are some sighting data. We have nest counts for areas where nests occur. And then there are potentially observed takes that can help add to what we know from, from the research that, that's out there when we can identify specific gaps. The important thing is that we need to understand how these data are collected and managed and understand that there are some significant limitations to these data. So again, we want to be forward looking, but we have to have a lot of these data in order to start integrating things and looking at cumulative effects and understanding them better. What can we do if we're a little bit data poor? Um, these data sets are, are often from organizations that have been inconsistently funded over the years. Uh, there may not be, may not have been a consistent QAQC process. Um, the sources of the data are often collected from volunteers um, or folks with various levels of, of training, and that's with the exception of probably the, the observer data. Um, so there's uh, some consistency issues. So when you look at these data, you need to look at them with a grain of, of salt. And so I think using these long-term data sets to support uh, your, your concerns about other data sets um, are, is, an important, is, is an important and interesting thing to do. So I'm going to drill down a little bit into the sea turtle data from Virginia just to show you some examples of, of things you might be able to look at and, and questions you might be able to ask using these data sets. So this is just a long-term um, graph of sea turtle strandings in Virginia from 1980 to 2022. And on the y-axis is just total number of strandings. The, I have not modeled these data. I have not applied statistics. It's just numbers. Um, but it appears to be that there might be a slight increasing trend in the number of turtles. And there's kind of a peak in the number of turtles from about 1997 to 2005. If we, if we drill down a little farther and separate these by species, we see that by species, the trends are slightly different with loggerheads being the driver of the pattern that we see because if you notice the y-axis here are different scales, loggerheads make up more than 80% of the total turtles we see in Virginia. So that peak in the 1997 to 2005 period is a loggerhead peak. And green turtles and Kemp's Ridley turtles have been doing something a little bit different, which is fairly consistently increasing in number in our stranding record. In fact, there were almost no green turtles that stranded in Virginia before the early 2000s, late 1990s. And those numbers have certainly been increasing in recent years. Uh, the last two species I'm showing at the top are leatherbacks and unidentified turtles. And I graph the unidentified turtles here to show you not that the number of unidentified turtles has really changed in, in the stranding record in Virginia, but the policies that have been given to stranding network participants actually change some of those numbers. So which turtles get counted um, is a policy, is a regional policy um, decision, and that changes how we, how we record our numbers. So in the early, uh, late 1990s, we were told to start looking at or recording floating turtles uh, that had not stranded in an area and include each individual report as a separate turtle. We didn't like that idea because we felt like we were double counting animals and so we asked to have that policy ended in 2003 and lo and behold the number of un unidentified turtles decreased. Recent increases since about 2014 are the result of another policy change where we were told to please capture as much as we could hook and line interactions with turtles, regardless of whether we had a photograph that could confirm that it was, in fact, a sea turtle and could confirm it to species. So those recent increases in unidentified turtles are from reports that we get from recreational anglers. If we look at sort of the temporal um, uh, aspect of stranding response, I think this is an area where we really can provide relatively up-to-date information about changes in, in the occurrence of animals in an area. Again, I've separated the animals by species. I've just taken five-year increments in different colors, with purple being the most recent uh, five-year increment from 2015 to 2019, and months of the year on the, on the x-axis. And as you can see, although the number of turtles has changed for loggerheads, the pattern is relatively similar, and this is a pretty crude look at it. Kemp's Ridley numbers, however, have seemed to have shifted earlier in the season from a peak in June to a peak in May. Uh, green turtles, which really, again, were not very present in our stranding record, seem to be developing uh, a stranding peak in, in October. If you look at, at most 
descriptions of, of green turtle presence, you're gonna see that they really don't occur from, from north of North Carolina. Uh, yet we are consistently seeing these animals in our area in Virginia and points north every year. Um, so this then brings up some questions. So we can use stranding data to question what we think we know about these species, especially in a rapidly changing climate environment that is, expecting, that is affecting this ectothermic set of species. If I take a look at that shift in, in Kemp's Ridley um, uh, appearance a, a little bit more closely. Right here I've graphed the date of the first Kemp's Ridley stranding and the date of the last Kemp's Ridley stranding in Virginia. So I've got years on the x-axis and Julian Day on the, on the y-axis. So the, the top graph is about um, early April to mid-July. The bottom is about mid-early October through the end of the year. And you can see sort of a de decreasing ten trend in the date of first stranding, meaning the turtles are appearing in the stranding record earlier and then increasing in the last animals stranded so that you can see that they seem to be staying in the area longer. So this is a, is a really good example of what we might want to start questioning about the data that we have from surveys. Ten-year-old survey data is not going to capture necessarily what's going on with the species right now. I also uh, am excited to hear that sea turtle stranding data will be uh, included in the portal. I know that marine mammal data are already in there. And, and I think the way it has been included is, is very important because, again, one of these limitations of using something like stranding data is that a stranded turtle is most often a dead turtle. And that turtle did not die where it, was, where it, was, where it occurred. In fact, it may not have died when it occurred either. So, what you see about where strandings occur may or may not be associated with where actual animals are. And so here I've taken Kemp's Ridley and loggerheads and I've compared a little heat map of strandings in Virginia um, on the left side with a recent paper that Andrew DiMatteo and colleagues uh, produced showing important habitat for these two species based on tagged turtles that were alive. And the orange is the important habitat. So again, just because a stranded turtle is on a beach doesn't mean that it was necessarily uh, active right off of that beach uh, before it died. And so we see here that loggerheads spend a lot of their time more in the main stem Chesapeake Bay, whereas the Kemp's Ridleys are close to shore and up the rivers, even though we don't have a lot of strandings in, in the rivers compared to the, the lower bay and ocean coastlines. So um, again, I want to encourage folks to use these data when they are available but it's very important to, to use them wisely. So um, I think it's important to understand the limitations of stranding and other long-term data sets that were not specifically collected for this reason. Um, and one way to understand the limitations is to talk to people that both collect and use the data, such as myself. Every state has stranding network organizations and stranding network coordinators. NIMPS has a regional coordinator. And, uh, and all of us are happy to help out with how these data are interpreted and prevent misinterpretation and, and allow you to, to include these in these important data in, in whatever ocean planning activities you're doing. So, thank you. Thank you, Sue. That was great, great work. And um, thanks for all your dedication to that over so many years. Um, next, we have Jessica Coakley with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. And she's a fishery management specialist with the council and the lead for the council's habitat activities and initiatives. And she's a longtime member of Marco's Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean. So thank you, Jessica. And um, we will get you started. And you're good to go. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about fish um, and what we're doing relative to fishery uh, resource conservation. For those of you that aren't familiar with the fishery management councils, um, there were eight of them that were created in 1976 as part of the Magnuson-Stevens Act uh, authorization. Those councils are charged with managing the nation's marine fishery resources in cooperation with NOAA Fisheries. Um, it's in the council process under the Magnuson-Stevens Act was really intended to be a regional participatory governance process. And with these eight councils around the country, um, they're able to manage fisheries at a regional um, scale appropriate um, way. The Mid-Atlantic Council uh, has representation comprised of seven um, states. 
We have seven fishery management plans. We manage 15 individual species under those plans, um, and then have 50 plus ecosystem component species that we also manage. Uh, the council spends an awful lot of their time um, setting um, fishing regulations, catch limits, um, uh, quotas, fishing regulations, but we do so much more um, beyond just preventing overfishing and rebuilding overfish stocks. Um, the council's um, management is intended to increase long-term economic and social benefits. We ensure a safe and sustainable supply of seafood um, and protect habitat that fish need to spawn, breed, feed, and grow to maturity. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other things beyond just setting um, fishery regulations that the councils um, do. Um, our council developed an ecosystem approach to fisheries management guidance document back in 2016. Um, the council wanted to find ways to incorporate ecosystem approaches into our management process in a stepwise strategic way. Um, so the council emphasized a number of areas of focus. Those included um, habitat, forage, climate change, interactions, so that includes interactions among species and interactions among fleets, and socioeconomics. And so this document was intended to be um, an umbrella document and that we would look for the ways that we could fold these um, focus areas into the work we do. So one of the areas the council's focused on recently is unmanaged forage um, and our fisheries. The council developed an unmanaged forage fish amendment and the goal was to proactively protect and conserve these species. Um, so the idea was to prohibit um, new or the expansion of existing directed fisheries on these species, and those include things like sand lance, anchovies, silver sides, those kinds of species, and to also establish an incidental possession limit for those species. We've added um, forage species, um, forage fisheries into our fishery management um, plan, so chub mackerel um, was added as a directed managed species. And our council is also trying to track um, unmanaged landings that are occurring in the region. So we work with NOAA Fisheries and review an annual report of trends and landings of these unmanaged species. Another big area of emphasis has been the um, fisheries habitat. Uh, as Pat Halpin mentioned, the Northeast Regional Marine Fish Habitat Assessment, NERA, has been a collaborative effort with multiple partners to describe and characterize fish habitat. Um, we have a number of products that are shared out on our NERA Data Explorer, and that is hyperlinked in the talk if you'd like to check that out. Um, but it explores information and data on trends in fish species. Um, we have climate habitat, um, vulnerability information that's provided in the Data Explorer, and it also includes some of the joint species distribution modeling work that Chris Hake is doing at Monmouth, um, and the outputs from that. Um, are all included in this application. And information from that application is going to be folded into an essential fish habitat um, amendment that our council is working on, and this is to improve our essential fish habitat designations that play a really important role in the NOAA fisheries um, consultations on projects that might affect fish habitat. So I know a lot of organizations like FOAM and Army Corps and other groups are engaged in those consultations, so that's a really important part of what our council's been working on. And um, a recent activity um, that's come out um, with the America, the Beautiful Initiative, um, the councils um, have prohibited um, fishery activities that may affect fish habitat um, in a number of conservation areas um, throughout the US. Um, as part of this America Conservation and Stewardship Atlas that's being developed with NOAA and DOI, um, the councils went through and developed a GIS database um, that inventoried all of these areas, um, and this information is going to be presented next week at the councils, so this is kind of hot off the press, but there were 648 areas um, that were identified, and this really documents what we've done in terms of the prohibition of environmentally destructive fishing gears within the region. And as you know, with a lot of the data products, you know, a first step in knowing what to do is knowing what you've done and what you have. Um, so this was a really big step that we now have data layers for all of these areas and it'll be available and accessible um, through the councils and through this atlas. 
And one of those areas that I think our council is particularly proud of is our deep sea coral protection area, um, the Frank Lautenberg protection area that was put into place a few years back, um, specifically to protect deep sea corals under those authorities. Our council's been doing a lot of work related to climate change um, and climate variability. Um, they've embarked on an exercise called climate change scenario planning. It's along the East Coast and involves all three councils, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, uh, as well as NOAA Fisheries. So it's really been a collaborative effort to provide um, information and explore um, jurisdictional and governance issues um, related to climate change. Um, we have a report that's coming out shortly on that and other products, but I know that's been a big area of work for our council. Um, as well as um, distribution and allocation issues that have come up recently for the councils. Our council each year now for the last few years works with NOAA Fisheries to get a state of the ecosystem report. Um, and this includes a lot of indicator level work um, with ecological indicators, environmental, economic, and social indicators for components of the ecosystem um, that provides our council with familiarity of all those environmental components in there, but our council has also been de developing a risk assessment associated with that state of the ecosystem report so we can prioritize um, different, different areas of work for the council. And um, scaling that ecosystem level work down then to the species specific level, we've also been taking a lot of that information and folding it into um, single species stock assessments and individual species profiles so we can take a closer look at how those ecosystem factors are impacting those individual species. So no, I know I talked a lot about these are sort of the things that we're doing right now, but we have a lot of ongoing and future challenges that we're dealing with. Um, over the last two days, you've heard a lot about offshore wind and other ocean uses, um, that's a big area of work for us and understanding the implications for our fisheries management, economics and science, that's an important component. Um, also working through the process and finding ways to develop acceptance of scientific findings, trust in the process uncertainty, um, that is always a challenge. It's been a particular challenge for us with our um, recreational components of our fisheries and then the just constant change that we're dealing with. COVID-19 had an effect on our fisheries um, and how those operated. Um, global markets have changed. Um, climate change is changing the distribution of our fish stocks, our forage, other components of the ecosystem. So dealing with all of those um, presents challenges. And uh, our councils tried to organize um, a lot of our issues and activities related to climate recently um, with our Climate Ready Fisheries page. Um, so some of the areas of work that I've talked about are emphasized on that page. If you want to find more information on that site, you can just follow the link. Um, but I do want to end, because I've been talking really fast and throwing a lot at you, um, with talking a little bit about some of our current needs for conservation. And I think these run along some of the themes I've already heard some of our speakers touch on. So I think our council um, would really benefit from products that help us understand how things have changed in the ocean space. There are a lot of folks working on products related to that, and I think additional products that help us understand that would be important, that help us anticipate how things may be changing, and that could be um, data-driven um, products or expert-driven knowledge um, of how things may change so we can kind of, kind of anticipate what's coming. Um, and then products that connect changing ocean conditions and ocean uses, changes in those, to impacts to our managed species. And we've heard a little bit of talk about different scales, and I think information is valuable at the local scale. We obviously manage at the regional scale, so that's an important component of it. Um, but we also heard a little bit about cumulative impacts. So with all of these other activities and changes happening at the same time, just cumulatively understanding what those impacts are um, would be really helpful. Um, we definitely look for products that help us plan and prepare, so ways to develop new decision support tools and new ways to put the information together in a way that can inform management. Also through our council's climate scenario planning process, some things that have really come out um, in a very obvious way have been the need to build better partnerships. 
And I think here with this group today, obviously we've got a lot of um, MAKO partners that are here, but building partnerships across fishing industry, these other ocean use industries, academia, govern government, ENGOs, um, and all of them working together to find ways to develop products to improve understanding and help us adapt to some of those changes. Um, and then lastly, um, figuring out how to build flexibility and adaptability throughout the whole system. And we work through a regulatory process. There's a bureaucratic component to that. It's not known for being particularly nimble, um, but things are changing very quickly. So finding um, efficiencies within the system and working to find those efficiencies um, across you know, the fishing industry, the shore side infrastructure, how we make management decisions, how we get data and science, and how our overarching governance works. Because um, that's definitely set up some challenges for our council where we've got you know, our council regions partitioned, but now we have three across the Atlantic coast with species moving across all through three council regions. Um, it definitely sets up challenges. Um, so I'll leave it with that. Um, if you have any questions, there's my email available there. I noted some of the links in the talk, and thank you for um, letting me speak with you today. Thank you so much, Jessica, and, and for all the work the council's doing. Um, everything that's good for the fisheries is good for wildlife in general, so we really appreciate um, all the work that you're doing there, and, and I hope you're all getting a sense of the incredible complexity of dealing with um, ocean wildlife and the data and understanding where things are, when they are. Um, it's <laughs> it's no, no longer just two-dimensional two maps. I mean, we're working in, in four dimensions, maybe even five. So our last speaker has a lot of weight on his shoulders, Dr. Sean Hayes, um, with NOAA's Protected Species Branch. Um, and so this will be our last speaker kind of wrapping up conservation measures and needs. So thank you very much for coming, Sean, and there you go. All right, thanks everyone for having me. Um, I was invited to speak about how NOAA is handling the implementation of MMPA and ESA policy. And and that's really the policy side of the house, and I'm not in it. So I'm, instead, I'm going to redirect. I've dug up a bunch of links that we have that have all the details on our agency's web pages on how we do that, and instead focus on uh, a social phenomenon that I've observed emerging as a, I think, an unintended consequence of these um, protected species laws, both MMPA and ESA, that I've seen throughout my career in NOAA. So first. Um, I have a series of definitions here, and the charismatic megafauna, and these are animals that have incredible social power or social value to humans for some reason. And, and a phenomenon that I, I sort of, this quote up here, you've all seen it before, I'm sure, um, really strikes me as being incredibly relevant to, um, to protected species. Um, I won't read it, but I'll just say that the, um, the I actually think Obi-Wan was bluffing, and he really just sort of served as a coach for the rest of the movie series and didn't exhibit a lot of power. But truly, in the, the halls of government, when these species start dying for whatever reason, and there's a stakeholder associated with that or a cause, it rises to a level that's really socially and politically at, equivalent to national security for, for whatever reason. I'm not trying to say it should be. It's just an these are observations. A different type of phenomena that we have in ecology is this concept of keystone species. And these are animals that are known to have sort of an undue f influence on the ecosystem around them, despite a relatively small population. Without them, the ecosystem is different in their absence. And so I want to, I've been thinking about this, and I actually want to merge the two concepts in, into a phenomenon I've been observing, which is that there are certain charismatic megafauna which have really risen to a level where they have undue influence on humans to force us and challenge us to reshape the ecosystem around them. So they're acting like a keystone species, but they may or may not be directly having that impact on the ecosystem itself, but they drive our policy in such a way that our policy is driven around their needs. I've seen this in several places. In the Pacific Northwest, the lands of rivers and forests, and above all else, salmon, um, these are the financial stats that Bonneville Power um, has been investing for the last, well, this is just from 2005 to 2015, um, in salmon recovery and fish passions just on the Columbia River 
to meet the coexistence of the power needs, the agricultural distribution networks, and commercial fishing, and the tech industry that is in and all of the cities of Portland, Seattle, Tri-Cities, et cetera. So this last line is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. In its point, Bonneville Power was investing more in salmon recovery on the Columbia River in the years 2010 and 2008, the National Marine Fisheries Service budget was to give you the sense of the scale of resources that go into ensuring the coexistence of these species with humans. Moving south to California, we have a valuable California Chinook fishery there. It's $460 million if you include all the expanded economic opportunities. But it really pales in con contribution to the overall California economy, which is poised to t exceed Germany as the fourth largest economy at the planet and almost $4 trillion. What I really learned in working in California was all of these industries and that drive and support the California economy, the state is effectively a desert. And so we transport water from the Sacramento Basin through the California Delta where it enters a series of aqueducts. Those aqueducts are then used to transport and distribute water to, there's 39 billion people in the state, 30 million people are really dis in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, Los Angeles, as well as the water infrastructure for the San Joaquin Agricultural Complex, are dependent on that water transport system functioning. That transport system, the pumps, sit at the southwest corner of the delta on the edge of the San Andreas and Hayward Faults and are below where San Francisco Bay is adjacent to the delta. And it's estimated a 6.5 magnitude earthquake would essentially cause an inland sea, a collapse of all the Delta Island levees, and flooding all the way to Sacramento within about 24 hours. That entire water infrastructure is a, is a deck of cards. And the interesting thing is about it, they can't fix it without an ESA ruling that ensures that we can uh, also continue the persistence and recovery of winter run Chinook salmon, which is a really important species in, in California watershed. So, Seven years ago, recognizing California wasn't that probably a very safe place to live, I moved back to the East Coast where I was born and grew up and, and got involved with this incredible critter here. Um, decided to, I had enough. <laughs> um, and, and we all know about the challenges around North Atlantic right whales. It, you know, the, the sort of the whale issue and offshore wind came up a lot yesterday and whatnot. And so I wanted to spend some time talking about that. So moving through here, we have a series, our population viability analysis team has really binned right whale challenges into four main threats. One is a, a stressor issue of, of acoustic noise in the ocean, and that comes from everything from shipping. Obviously, there are um, concerns about energy, both petroleum, renewable, and non-renewable in the ocean. Um, the next is another one that's a big challenge is vessel strike. And if this is going to work, here you have an animation, the red dot is and this will loop, is a tagged right whale calf making its first migration up along New Jersey and New York coasts. And the blue dots are the, the average vessel traffic that basically comes in and out of New Jersey and New York all the time. Um, so you can see how this is a pretty rough way to make a living as a, as a right whale in the coastal environment. Um, and then, of course, we have climate change. Really, the rapid acceleration of the ecosystem changes in the Gulf of Maine around 2010 really set back right whale recovery and estuary restoration or recovery, it reshuffled the deck on where they were going in the ocean and our, our spatially structured management stra strategies essentially began to fail us as they moved into areas where they were unprotected. And, and now we have these emerging concerns of what will be the impacts of offshore wind on climate change and the animals' abilities to find food and recover. And then finally, the, the really equally big challenge to vessel strikes is, is entanglement and, and dealing with the, the challenges between you know, persisting our commercial fisheries along with the recovery of this animal. These animals, all of this gets to the point where the right whales are a driver of this ecosystem-based management concept because unlike humpbacks or fin whales or sea turtles, the, what we've calculated for this species is its potential biological removal, which is the human-induced mortality that the species can, say, can sustain, comes down to about 0.7 right whales per year which basically means all of these sectors have to coordinate with each other to ensure that whatever they're doing collectively is not impacting the North Atlantic right whale at some level above 0.7 whales per year. And so that forces a conversation across these different industries. So I used to think when I was starting here that 
right whales were firmly planted in single species management, but as I've been thinking about it more and more and more, they are the linkage that's forcing co-planning and consideration as a backstop across all of these other marine sectors. So, ecosystem-based management and keystone management species, what motivates people? Jason Link put together this you know, sort of food web of all the connections and interlinks of the, the North Atlantic you know, food web and ecosystem, and, and we know this is important science, and it's really, but it's really hard to wrap your heads around how the Leopold in the um, um, Sand County Almanac made the comment that um, the average, a scientist is good at that job, knows they can't actually understand what is actually happening at this level of complexity, whereas the average citizen thinks we do. And, and so we have, the, we're struggling with this connection of how do we manage the sciences. But in the reality, at the end of the day, you know, people, and it, well, this came up yesterday, that people have a hard time understanding the complexity of these new technologies, what are the implications for them, what are the benefits, you know, but they do understand for whatever reason that if you tell them tomorrow there won't be a right whale or tomorrow salmon won't return to Puget Sound or the Columbia River, that's something they wrap their heads around. And for whatever reason, it rises to a political level where they talk to their congressionals and or now that we've got Ultra Wind, the president, I've discovered on a regular basis, um, and find out, you know, we need to do something about this. And, and so in many ways, these animals become our social conscience for doing things that we wouldn't necessarily do for ourselves. The other thing is, they become a shield. So there's so many other species that, I mean, there's tons of charismatic megafauna out there, and there's millions of species out there. But for whatever reason, these species become so iconic that we'll do almost anything and invest in almost anything to say no. We will draw this line in the sand. These species, are not, we're not going to let them go. And as a result, the protections that go into place for them have these cascading benefits for everything on the right. So by, because we sort of force you know, coordination across all of these other sort of human use needs, that it then has this cascading benefit for these other species. In the 21st century, human needs are still fundamentally food, water, and shelter. The definition of shelter has changed um, since the beginning of our, our species. It, it now includes having a nice house, hopefully. Um, energy is the really big change, and, and defense. Um, all of those things are essential. And this is where I don't have my notes, and I was like, where am I gonna go with this concept? Um, and so let me just sort of pause and catch my breath here. We need all of these things. and and the sort of solutions to co-managing these things are simple. We have to sort of balance our needs with ecosystem sustainability. The challenge, of course, is that we hit eight billion people this year. If you ever look at the COVID, you know, during the COVID area, we, our population increased by over a quarter billion people in the COVID years, so give you a sense. And we're going to hit 10 billion by all projections in 25 years. The la when I was preparing this talk a week ago, they were saying we're likely to hit the 1.5 C tipping point in 10 years, the um, World Meteorological Organization said because of the pending El, El Nino, now it's gonna be five years. Um, and so we have all of these challenges before us. And in many respects, you know, we think and are gonna try and engineer our way out of these solutions. And, and we will need the ocean. We've sort of run out of space in many respects for the land for the land to help meet our food, water, and energy security needs. We will have to use the ocean for it to do this. And in many respects, we're going to industrialize the ocean. There's, there's no way around that. But it's these species that I think are gonna sort of put that backstop on society to say, no, we're, we're going to ensure that the ocean still performs its fundamental ecosystem functions, which at the end of the day, we need as much as we need more renewable energy and more food sources and aquaculture, and et cetera. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Sean. That was a little bit of a depressing way to end, but, <laughs> but, um, um, but all too true, and that, yeah, that is our huge challenge. So um, we have a few more minutes. Um, uh, do we have any questions online, any virtual? We have one. Maybe we'll take one virtual, and if anyone from the audience has one, come down to the microphone, and then we'll start with the Mentimeter questions. But yeah. So the question is for Pat. Um, in the mid-Atlantic where offshore wind activities are proposed, uh, aside from NARW, 
Are there any studies currently that focus on joint modeling of other marine mammals and fish populations? All right. Is um, still online with us? There he is. I am. Yes, and have been listening in. Um, we have some work that's all in process. So I'm always a bit hesitant to be talking about things that haven't haven't come out yet. But we do have one paper that's looking at bottlenose dolphin, triceops, um, and fish that is finalized and in final review. And we have other work looking at baleen whales, outback whales, and fish, um, prey, so small prey species. So there are things in the queue. Um, but using that same modeling idea of how do we actually look at these interactions jointly. Um, but this is my main point was this is kind of new directions, new efforts that are underway and you're going to probably see, you know, a lot of new activity in the next three to five years um, on that, on that topic. Great. Thank you, Pat. Do we have some from the audience, someone coming down? And I, I know we have another one online too. And, while she's coming down, I'll just let you know, we're going to put the Mentimeter questions up and leave them up over lunch so you have time. But please go ahead with your question. Hi, my name is Judith Weiss. I have just one question, but I first want to put in a little bit of good news for um, this, many of the species in the ocean are dependent on the estuary. I mean, here, the New York, New Jersey Harbor is the nursery for a lot of the species in the ocean. And um, I put together a proposal to Mission Blue about a year ago. And uh, having gone through the whole process, we have now been designated as the Hope Spot, the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary, which used to be really disgusting. People my age remember that you never would want to go near the water. You couldn't get near there, but you wouldn't want to be there because it was full of toxic waste and human sewage and everything. And the amazing recovery that has taken place over the past several decades in terms of fish diversity, birds, whales uh, coming back here, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. And uh, that should be helpful to the biodiversity and fisheries in the nearby ocean. So that's my piece of good news. <laughs> My question about the right whales. Um, I heard uh, Michael Moore, is that his name, at, at Woods Hall, about years ago, about ropeless traps. And I wonder, are they ready to really be adopted? And couldn't NOAA subsidize the, the fishermen, the, the lobster people in New England and I guess it would have to be DFO in Canada, help the fishermen buy these ropeless traps, which obviously are more expensive than the standard ones. And that's my question for you. Green, I should be. Green. So short answer is yes. Um, and we started that in 2017. Um, one of our regional offices freed up about 150,000 to say, we need to do something different. and so. I had a gear team that was working on sea turtle entanglement and reprogrammed them to say, we're going to start doing ropeless fishing. So that was 2017. This year, collectively, Congress put about $50 million into that between NOAA, a NIFWIF grant of $20 million, and another $26 million to the Atlantic States Marine Fish Commission. Since 2017, we basically, what we started with the program was we be, began building, in collaboration with Michael Moore and other donations, a gear library. So we basically put out a you know, I was talking about the political night, the, the bureaucratic nightmare of trying to order every single ropeless mark, piece of equipment on the market, you know, and telling, and, you know, and our, our purchasers are like, well, no, you have to pick the best one. You're like, we don't know what the best one is. <laughs> and so we had to go through that bureaucracy, but basically give us 10 of everything, you know, and now we're up to, you know, sometimes over 100 of some of the different versions of technology. Um, and we have a gear library that we basically loan out to any fisherman that's willing to work with us on our experimental fishing permit. We have, we are continuously replenishing a fund, the Atlantic States Marine Fish Commission, where we pay those fishermen for their time and efforts to compensate them to take that gear out, use it, trial it. We have 
increasing number of staff that we're hiring to go out and work as trainers with those fishermen. So they, we teach them how the gear is supposed to be used, and we tell them, put it through your real world scenario, bring it back broken, and we'll talk to the vendor about why it didn't work. They'll fix it, and we'll get it back to you, and you keep doing this. And so we've been doing this cycle for six years now. Um, so there's a lot of work. That's the technology. There's sort of, th I call it the the, the trinity of ropeless challenge. The first one is just the physics of getting gear up and down from the bottom of the ocean. That's really just Newtonian physics. We're pretty good at that. The second challenge is the, the um, issue of gear conflict, which is the how does everyone suddenly know where, if we, for 300 years we've been using the buoy as the way of saying my stuff's here on the bottom of the ocean for better or worse, and that's how everyone navigates around. So we essentially are having to build what is the, your Google Maps our app in your smartphone but for the ocean seafloor, so that a fisherman can see on his chart plotter where everyone else's gear is. And not just for the lobster fishermen, but for the mobile fishermen, the scallopers, the trawlers, they have to know where all that stuff is too. So we're building that technology and we've um, partnered with Allen Institute um, to use their Earth Ranger, Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And they basically committed to basically, we will be the background data support for, the, for this and for anyone else on the planet who wants to do it forever. Um, and so we've got that support as well. And then the third and arguably the hardest hurdle is getting the sort of the coordination through all the fisheries. So we have to, for the first time ever, we, you know, normally when we regulate right whales, we're regulating the, the responsible stakeholder or party. But to do ropeless fishing, we have to regulate other parties that aren't necessarily responsible for it. So we have to move through the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Magnuson Fisheries Management Council, or Fisheries Management Act, and then we have to coordinate, oh, and the Atlantic Coastal Act, which is where the lobster fisheries manage. Then we have to work through the New England Fisheries Management Council, the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, and the Atlantic States Marine Fish Commission. All of that has to be coordinated. And so the hardest part is really the this process of working through all of this and the social change and acceptance and the economics behind all of it. So, but, but we're working very, very hard on that, so. Thank you, Sean, that's encouraging. Um, the ropeless technology idea is, is a wonderful one. I hope it really takes off. It's, yeah, it's, it's just a matter of time for yeah. better or worse. So. We'll get there, we'll get there. Uh, any more, uh, do we have another, oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you thought I was just sitting here. It's Matt. Strangely, hey. yeah, just sitting up front. Hey, everybody. Uh, and I don't know, Pat, Emily, if you could see my face. I don't think so, but hi. Um, you know, Surfrider is in a really tough spot on offshore wind. We're tentatively trying to, uh, you know, do some support of offshore wind. But we're really going to be relying on monitoring and adaptive management. And uh, for a while now, I've realized I don't exactly know how to explain to people how monitoring and adaptive management is gonna happen. You know, there's, there's your group, Emily, there's Pat's group, there's the industry, there's the, regula you know, the regulatory agencies. Is there a, a, a blog or a web page that already exists or could be built that kind of lays out who would actually do the monitoring? You know, is it, is it the government? Is it Rutgers? Is it WOW? Uh, who's paying for it? Is it the government? Is it the industry? Is it? Is it whoever, um, and how that will, how that data will flow? I, I just need something simple because uh, we're really banking on being able to see if something bad starts happening with offshore wind and not just be flying blind. So I hope that makes sense. And if we have, t I have time. I do have more questions, but I will sit over here. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I'll if, take a quick stab at that. Hey, Matt. Um, the answer to each of your questions is everybody is doing monitoring. Everybody is funding the monitoring. I think it can only work if we have multiple entities out there doing the monitoring, multiple entities out there funding the monitoring, all for different purposes. Some are doing that sort of like almost emergency mitigation monitoring. Like, is there something about to happen? We need to know right now. And there's other monitoring that is much more longer term and understanding the ecosystem more broadly and over broader spatial scales. It's all necessary at multiple levels. So there is no one blog post that describes it all. It's an RWSE science plan with respect to offshore wind and wildlife. That will, it'll describe who's doing what um, and what else is needed and how we all work together 
um, the adaptive management piece and implementing it is not RWSE's responsibility, but many of the entities that are partners of RWSE do have those responsibilities. So they will, um, I hope, be, you know, they are contributing to the science plan, and I hope they will use the science plan to facilitate their responsibility to do adaptive management. So no single blog post, but I mean, maybe a, there is a blog post about the science plan that you can pull and just point people to that when it comes out um, in, a, in a month or so. Thanks, Emily. Did you want to add something, Pat? I wasn't sure if you were nodding or. I, I'm agreeing wholeheartedly with Emily. Hi, hi Matt. Um, I, I do very much second the issue that Emily brought up about the multiple scale, space and time scales. And there's going to be you know, monitoring that's already begun that's at you know, high frequency passive acoustic monitoring that's you know, listening for whale calls. There's going to be observers on vessels while construction's going on. There's going to be you know, people looking at seasonal data to see are we starting to see trends emerge and then all the way up until you know, multi-seasons to multi-years to kind of decadal timeframes to actually see do we actually see trends so really that monitoring is gonna be a stack of a whole lot of different layers. Um, and some of it could be, you know, near real time stuff to things that are gonna be much more, you know, what's the seasonal trend over three or four or five years. So, so I think you're gonna to need to be, you know, it's gonna be very question driven. And so for surf rider, you know, you you will actually be very important to try to characterize what are the, you know, what's the space and time scale that you guys need answers and or, or several different ones and think about it that way because that could help direct you to the right data sources for the right kind of information. Great, thank you, Pat. I think, do we have time for one, one more question? I think there were another virtual one. Was it for Sean? Or <laughs> a quick one, Matt, and then maybe we'll take that one more that was online. And then it's not we'll... a quick one, so maybe you should go. Oh. <laughs> Did it look like a quick one online for Sean? Do you want to go ahead and ask it, Janet? Do you think we have enough scientific evidence to confidently say that offshore winds cumulative impacts are negligible and minor? Oh. <laughs> Is that a no? <laughs> It's a loaded question, and, and the short answer is no. But I also, and I'm gonna take off my Noah hat and just speak as a citizen who has two little girls that need to grow up in a world I'm gonna leave behind them. We don't have time to wait with climate change, to not do something to stop it. And so, you know, to think the consequences of climate change versus the consequences to you know, some of these species. It, I, it's one of those things, that, that's what keeps me up at night. Like, do I, do I drive the decision between the, the world I leave for my little girls and do I leave it with right whales or do I leave it with you know, a, a place where they aren't dealing with climate refugee, you know, trying to get out of the equatorial region into the northern parts of the climate and food shortages and collapse and energy shortages and war. Like, because that's what's coming if we don't figure this out, right? Like, people think this is, this isn't just, you know, if you go to an offshore wind meeting in ICs and in, in Europe right now, it's a national, a, a, a continental security issue. This isn't just an energy issue and, you know, do we get our energy from this versus that and is it going to impact the whales? It's a national and global security issue. Energy security and renewable energy in the face of climate change is what it comes down to. So... No, short answer is no, we don't know what the consequences will be. Um, part of the reason, I often use the salmon example, you know, we, we went through the great era of dam building and we knew fish passage would be a problem. We had no idea what the physical consequences to river habitats would be. We didn't even understand evolution or ecology really when we built most of the great dams and the consequences to salmon stocks have been huge. We have 26 listed stocks of salmon, all of which are, you know, have fish passage and dam building as a limiting factor, you know. So, so there are going to be consequences of of doing this. But I personally, not representing NOAA or any federal agency, I I don't think we have a choice. Yeah. Yeah, Sue. 
I think, I think you can turn the question around a little bit and say, is there anyone who can say that the alternative, which is offshore oil and gas development, is, is better? Because I don't think any of us in this room, or really anywhere, believe that that that, that alternative is, is better than offshore wind. Um, and so, yes, there might be consequences, and we don't know what those consequences are going to be, but I think we're all pretty sure that they're going to be less than the alternatives. Well, on that note, I would love to really thank all of our wonderful speakers. Thank you, Pat, Emily, Sue, Jay, Sean, <laughs> Jessica. Great, great, great panel. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put up the uh, Menti questions. And so you go to your smartphone and just go to the website, uh, www.menti.com, and put in that code. And there's three questions. Oh, until it advances. Go ahead and answer. Yeah, go ahead and answer that if you would, and then we'll advance to the next question. We needed that music again from yesterday. Somebody was singing the Jeopardy song. <laughs> got some good instructions now. <laughs> so what we're going to do is leave this one in and give you time to answer it because it takes a little while um, to advance to the next one. So keep your smartphone with you if you would and then look for the next question to come up and keep answering. Um, but I don't want to detract too much from lunch and the poster session. We have some wonderful um, um, students and um, what was that term that uh, Nicole used this morning? Advancing advancing leaders, <laughs> some folks that are um, hopefully going to have careers in ocean management have their posters here. So please um, take a look at those. We do have an hour and, and a half for lunch. And again, thanks to Monmouth for providing our lunch. There's tables set up out in the lobby there. So you can grab a lunch and uh, sit down. And we'll be back here at 2 o'clock. And we will, um, these results, you can see word cloud. Um, each question has a, a different kind of answer, a word cloud or multiple choice or whatever. Um, so we'll, of course, be saving these and uh, imagine they'll go into the, the, some sort of workshop summary um, that'll be available to everyone later. So with that, thank, thanks again to our panel and um, thank you all for listening today and I hope you got some good ideas about what we need to do next. Um, be sure to answer that last question about what you want our MAKO Ocean Conservation Work Group to do over the next couple of years. And um, thank you again, and we'll see you after lunch.
All right, welcome back everyone. And 